Yes, what is going on everybody? Welcome back to another brand new Rugby Muscle Podcast. I'm your host as always, TJ, and today I am joined in an interview episode by Ari Guerrero, who is a strength and conditioning coach and a super smart guy with a very interesting background, which makes for a really interesting episode that a lot of you guys are going to get a lot of takeaways from. Now, before I get into this episode, I would just like to take 20 seconds to say if you are enjoying the podcast, particularly the interviews, let me know by giving five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify. I think you can do so on Stitcher or wherever you get your podcast doesn't let you give five-star reviews. Apple Podcasts or Spotify is the way forward. That really does help out. If that still is not quite convenient for you, sharing this uh, podcast on your Instagram stories and tagging us at Rugby Muscle on Instagram really also helps out. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, just giving a thumbs up and leaving a comment makes the world of difference. You can say a comment in reaction to anything Ari or I say, or you can just leave a comment just, just to help out the algorithm. All comments really do help out the algorithm and they make a huge difference to us. And we'd be greatly appreciative of that. And obviously then pursue more strength and conditioning discussions on the podcast or just keep growing the show um, and keep providing you with content on the YouTubes, on the podcasts that you can enjoy. With that in mind, let's get into this episode right away. Let's go. So I, I found when I was coaching in, in Portugal, I, I did like a little, little close to two months coaching in, in actual Portugal. And you have to choose your words very carefully as to what to say mm. for people to get the information, you know? I believe what they found, you know, like, especially when you go in a new country, for example, for me in Brazil, and now here in Japan, is actually make everything that is complex simple. Yes. And you can actually use just some keywords that they, they have a meaning for them, actually not for us, you yeah. know? Because sometimes if I want to express the concept, even using some Italian background, it's not going to work. It does not make sense for them. And it was, it was fun. And now, for example, here in Japan is even, I believe, harder because Portuguese, uh, it's similar. Yeah. It was uh, similar to Italian grammar. But here in Japan, it's even, uh, it's even harder. And I gave uh, myself the goal six months and i'm trying to express myself always in japanese because that's what they say the players need to speak to me talk to me in japanese and i will try to reply in english and when it's going to be the time i will start replying in japanese so nice we i've had a guy on the podcast before a guy called terence and he he coached in japan actually so did yeah. kia i've had a few guys from japan but terence said his first session they put him in at the deep end and they just said okay look go go coach None of these, none of them spoke English. He's like, go do this speed session. And he's like, yeah, oh. like, but you, you <laughs> figure out a way because you, you have to, you're right. You have to be simple. Even though the answers that you want might be complex. If you can be simple, yeah. they can find the answers themselves. And, and that's quite cool because the answers aren't uh, are complex and they're probably different for, for different people. You not everyone, even yeah. from like a basic technique background, right? Like mm -hmm. not everyone moves the same. So yeah, that's, how, how did you um, find yourself in in Japan in the first place? Is this your first time coaching in Japan? Yeah, to be honest, yes. Actually, I knew Japanese culture before because I had been in Japan first time in 2000 and 2008. It was the first time, but just uh, traveling. And we came here for the World Series, the Women World Series in Kitakyushu in 2017. And I met the high performance manager now of the Nagato Blue Angels at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, we, we have been in contact during the preparation for the Olympic game of Tokyo. We have been here for uh, our final preparation. And uh, when I finished with working over in Brazil, yeah, he said, oh, are you interested in uh, coming over and having an experience here in Japan? And I knew already the facility, I knew the team, uh, so it was uh, easier. And I came over in, in March because there was still a problem with the virus. Japan was still um, really close to the foreigners. Now it's opening a little bit more. And so end of March, I came here. And yeah, now in the beautiful place, Nagato. 
and enjoying the culture, good food. And I believe Japan, you know, like after the World Cup, the men World Cup, uh, the investment in rugby and the professionalism went up. And so mm-hmm. even the, even the rugby sevens, uh, the investment is good. It's, it's professional. So yeah, there is all the support from the city, from the council. And so you have almost everything. Here, the setup, for example, is really good. We have really good field, gym. We have the pool close to the close to us, and make everything easier. Uh, nice. Everything you want to plan as an SNC coach is easier. That's cool. Interesting though, because one of the reasons that we were originally going to speak when you first contacted mm-hmm. me back when you were yeah. coaching for Brazil was about dealing, you know, maybe the struggles that we deal with with um, tier two nations, and 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 maybe even yeah. now you can have a better comparison because you can see, oh, this mm-hmm. is actually what happens when the investment is like really there. You know, before we do that, let's talk about like so. You've got quite an interesting background. So you're you're a thrower originally. I've done yeah, my research, right, Ali? Right, yeah. you're a thrower, yeah. Uh, yeah. and then went to New Zealand. So touch yeah. on that and how that sort of influenced your your career, and then yeah. end up being as a rugby strength and condition coach. It's it's funny because so I, I you said right I, I was a shot putter shot putter and discus thrower so my background is track and field and I used to train in this good Olympic center back in Parma in Italy famous for pole vault and the athletics actually gave me even at that time I did not know gave me a really good base of understanding of uh, running technique, plyometric workout, the jumps, medicine ball workout, Olympic uh, lifting. But at that time, when I was an athlete, I did not understand, you know. But in time, when I went back and studying and starting the, the master's degree, everything did make sense. And so, yeah, I did study in Rome. And after that, when I finished the, um, the master's degree in sports science, I did look around in Italy. Nothing was coming out. And a friend of mine that is working with the Benetton Treviso, Mm-hmm. And he gave me a contact of this, this good friend now, actually, for me, it's almost a father, that is Jim Love, former Maori All Blacks. And I went, start, I started my internship over in, in New Zealand, down in Wellington, in the city of a really big community of Maori and Samoans. And started as an intern, and after three months, he said to me, he said, oh, are you keen? Do you want to be my head strength and conditioning coach? And I said, I love it. And New Zealand, beautiful, beautiful country. I don't know if you already had the chance to be there, but it's uh, definitely another country to visit. Yeah, it's, um, on, it's on the list. I haven't, I haven't, yeah. I, some people are shocked to hear I've never, yeah, I've never made it that far. I've got as close as what South Africa, which is not close, uh, mm-hmm. and, and you know, South Asia, but Australia and New Zealand are, are soon on the list. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Yeah, like in New Zealand, Maori culture, Samoan culture, actually uh, island culture, you know, Pacific Island is really, I believe, close to the Italian one. Mm-hmm. And the culture of the food, uh, family, everyone being together. So I did uh, integrate myself really fast in that environment, working mainly with 15 and rugby league and netball. And yeah, New Zealand was for me my, my second nation. I would have never left New Zealand if it was not for the Olympic game that came up in, in Rio in 2016. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, probably New Zealand gave me the understanding of uh, a country that has, is really good in, uh, in that sport. So for example, take uh, rugby because it's not only rugby, they, they're good in uh, a lot of sports. Rugby is the main one. And you understand uh, how, for example, what they apply there not necessarily is going to function in another uh, environment, in another situation. And for me, it was clear because uh, after New Zealand, I went over to Brazil and it was everything different. And for me, it was clear from the beginning, if I'm going to try to apply what I saw in New Zealand in Brazil, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Do do you think that's a... There's like a, it's a cultural thing mostly from New Zealand that, that because we've had this discussion uh, a few times about you know how they're so successful and obviously rugby being the part of the ingrained in the culture is primarily the reason it's not because they sweep the change rooms which you know it's a good thing yeah, to yeah. do but it's not like people sometimes mm-hmm. miss the forest through the trees with that sort of stuff so what is it culturally about New Zealand then that makes them because you're right it's not it's you know they've got rowing 
They've got many other sports where they're not necessarily dominant, but for the, yeah. the, the size of the country, they're extremely competitive, right? Yeah. There is one thing I'm going to mention, actually, because I don't think I heard it before, but in New Zealand, everyone as well practice track and field, you know? Mm. Um, all the kids at school, they have a try track and field. It's part of that. So um, some, you have kids uh, practicing throwing, sprinting, uh, long distance running. So I think that one is a part as well uh, to create that base of movement background. And after mm -hmm. that, of course, everyone, you know, most of them, they specialize in rugby, rugby league, and rugby sevens, of course. But the fact is this, you know, like when you get those players and uh, when they get 18 years old, 19 years old, the rugby understanding and the physical part, they're already there, you know, and when they get, for example, in a high level or high performance environment, uh, it's just um, actually executing what they've yeah. done before. Mm -hmm. While uh, imagine Brazil situation, it's different because you get some players that they actually don't have big boom movement background because most of them, they're just practicing football. Yep. They don't have big understanding of rugby because rugby is not big sport in Brazil. And so most of the time, even in a high performance environment, is dedicated, is allocated just to that. Yeah. And uh, if you want to do just 20% of that, 20% of that, 20% of that, uh, is actually is going, you are going to have less results. For me, there was the big, uh, the big difference. And it, it's clear. Uh, it's clear because um, the understanding and the view of the game of those nations, uh, it's nowhere come. Uh, you cannot compare that with uh, tier two or even a tier three nation. No, um, or, or even some know. tier one nations to an extent, yeah, yeah. I, I think. Yeah. Like there's, and this is a discussion I've just had on another podcast with my, my fellow coach, Alex, who like mm. we're, we're discussing the big, like the, the difference between the top 20% versus the top five percent is much bigger than you know anything else like like from 50 to 20 you know and then even that five to one is huge like the, the further you get to the more and more elite like mm -hmm. making those jumps is much more difficult than than what a lot of people would think and it's you know yes there's probably a big genetic component like you know yeah. the, the yeah. new zealanders yeah, have a lot of the pacific islanders or even just yeah. people that have the best you know they have good genetics that they've grown up with and that sort of stuff. But as you say, by the time they're 18, by the time they start their professional career, almost, they've already got everything set up. They're not making up the ground. Whereas, as you say, probably Brazil, like they would have to put all of that work in just to get to where these other New Zealanders already are. And then they're doing years of just extra dedicated stuff. So it's a, yeah, it's a completely different yeah. thing. You know, like, for example, for us, what was normal to have even men 15, whatever, sevens, uh, uh, women and men, we had to put in count at least four or five years of uh, high performance environment just to develop them, you know, while it's different situation in those nations. And for me, as SNC coach, as soon as I understand that, as soon as I can find a strategy, to make it, yeah, that's such an important aspect. And they, that, of course, influence as well the technical part, you know, technical and tactical, because the, the time that you actually spend on that part, you need to take that time off from, you know, probably the essence. And uh, yeah. that's just the way it is. 100%. And that was actually one, probably one of the bigger thoughts I had along this line was that, like, because, as you said, there's, yeah, they these, these, top tier athletes they they get to 18 19 20 maybe even like 16 right and, and they're already yeah. close to their potential right so everything else from then on is just refining you've got mm -hmm. you will have some athletes in brazil i know firsthand that like they've got people that are the that, that start rugby when they're that age you know they haven't sure. even done rugby yeah. yeah they start so, the rugby too. yeah so you know and th there'll be people watching and listening to this that probably started rugby at that age as well. And you've got to realize that yeah. it's not then there's two things, right? Mm -hmm. So there's two ways you can go from that. Number one, yeah. you can go from the mindset of, okay, but I've got this athletic background. There's a reason I've decided to come to rugby yeah. and I'm better, I'm a better athlete than a lot of these people. And that's great. And you want to, you know, look at Carlin Isles. There's a lot of examples more on sevens than there are on fifteens. Yeah. There are yeah. these examples of guys that have come over and, 
because of their athleticism, they want to keep that, right? You don't want Kyle Niles to get slow down to, to focus on and become a better passer. But at the same time, as you just said there, they do have to spend a lot of time doing their technical and their tactical preparation, which even as professionals will take away time from strength and conditioning. And it's something that I say to, because I work with basically exclusively with amateurs and I'm saying to these guys, right. You know, if you're, if you're looking for another edge, you know, Mm -hmm. it's doing more than five sessions a week, plus on top Mm -hmm. of your work, plus on everything else, like you could, but why not just spend, you know, if you're only training once a week or if you're in off season and you're not even training, why not spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes just working and drilling your, your skills or different things like that? Those are going to have a much bigger impact on your on your rugby. And I, I imagine it's the same thing with you guys, right? You have to say, okay, well, this person needs more and more game time, which means I can't do as much with them in the gym. Is that how you would approach it with the Brazilian? That's the one. Precise, you know, like uh, accurate. Because I'm going to bring up a, a really a good example. For example, on the woman's side, one of... Um, we had really fast team, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, Brazil is the fast team on the World Series. Probably um, the three between Talia, Gabi and Bianca, they are some of the fastest on the World Series uh, with 32.5 kilometers per hour each. And we had, for example, Lima, Gabi, she, she came from track and field at the age of 26. So at 26, uh, you know, like some of that uh, model learning is already fixed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's going to be hard and actually it's a problem if you want to change it and she came from track and field uh, hurdles so mainly linear the main work i had to do is first do not turn the, the speed <laughs> first do not create problem on that side and most of the work it was actually you know like trying at that speed to improve ability to change of direction to react to react to a stimulus external one and most of the work you know, was done on rugby wise mm-hmm. because the speed was already there. Yeah. And as SNC coach, uh, uh, together with the staff, you see it and say, okay, what is the plan for this athlete? We need her on the field. Her weapon is actually her speed. All right, I'm happy on my side. Physio side, what you need to do. Technical side, what you need to do. Because probably the main problem is understanding of rugby, you know. And the contact part, um, the handling, and as, as as you said, you know that's just a matter of uh, designing the better strategy because at the end the performance is measured on the field, not just mm. in testing. Yeah, you know, it's it's one that I get a lot with amateurs because they they're already you know especially here right they 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 contact me because they think oh I, I want to do more in the gym. Probably that means that they already love the gym. Probably that means that they're already pretty strong. And then they'll hear me say, you know, okay, we probably don't need to spend that much more time working on your strength. Like we, you, you know, you're, you're already squatting double body weight. Yeah. You don't need to do, yeah. you know, like that's getting more strong at this point is not a benefit for you. What, what you might need to do is just run 5k consistently and just get fit enough. And a yeah. lot of people don't want to hear that, but that's, that's going to make a big difference because if you can, you know, if someone can hit hard in that first instance, but they don't hit hard, you know, because they're so yeah. tired or, mm-hmm. you know, from your example, if someone's already really fast, you know, like they don't need to do, they don't need to have mm-hmm. any time to do, especially in sevens, like they've already yeah. got the space, they can be fast, they can do all their stuff, they just need to um, figure out, right, how can I get enough basic skills that I can then use this speed that I already have. And for you, it's, yeah, yeah it, that's, that's probably she's at a level where the advanced yeah. athletes in New Zealand and Australia can't keep up with her. And, and that's either genetics or that's a trained thing as well, right? Where she's already at an elite level yeah. where they're going to spend years yeah. trying to catch her up and get that speed. So she's got yeah. to yeah. make that difference and, and, and win on the field. It's, a, it's interesting, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. For example, here, you know, like uh, in in Japan, complete different strategy. You know, uh, apart that in this situation here, working with more with club uh, environment, you get at least from different countries: uh, Fiji, New Zealand, uh, Netherlands, Japan. So you know, it's different strategies. Uh, okay, individualizing the work because uh, you have athletes that come from different background. But that's you know another challenge. Yeah. You know, because uh, with Japanese athletes, 
you, you may need to do some kind of work, maybe improving their speed, uh, their power, because they're really good, uh, have good mobility, good in the gym. With some other athletes, uh, for example, even Fiji, you know, they uh, have really good understanding of rugby, you know, but mm-hmm. sometimes, especially in the gym, they still need to work on that understanding of how their body function regarding resistance training. Yeah, so that's another, it's different challenge different challenge yeah and uh, it's one of those things if you want like it's it's they move already quite well and and, you know Mm -hmm. that's something that they differentiate but there's a level of i don't know potentially that that it's it there's a risk of being injured because there is an inefficiency in that movement but but they what they practiced is slightly incorrect but they've got in so many repetitions at a good level to then make it work for them, they, they kind of get away with it. But then that would be your job would be to not, not necessarily correct it, kind of as we said with the language barrier, it's to sort of give them enough movements that will then teach their body to move slightly more efficiently. Yeah. yeah. Would you do that a lot with your, with your other tier two athletes when you were in, with Brazil? Like, because I imagine, again, if the, even if they're, we're not, we're, maybe we're not talking about the, 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 comp, the, the girls that have come over from, um, at the, an athletics background, yeah, but we're talking about girls that have just played good level, you know, and they've, and they've been impressive, but they're probably yeah. still really raw, right? So then they've got to do learning on all in all areas. You know, like really good points, right? The fact is, these, for example, even men's side is the same, right? The men 15 at the time when, when I was as well with the men 15, you get uh, these athletes, they, they come in the system and you need to do all the basic work, for example, uh, teach them. Uh, how to uh, deadlift, teach them how to squat, to do correctly a bench press. And uh, again, the, the challenge is sometimes that they come in your hand uh, when uh, s- most of their movement, they are already fixed. So mm-hmm. the difficult part is uh, what you're going to do. Are you going to break it? <laughs> so you actually have a reduction, you know, in performance. The performance goes down before you need to go up. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, that progression requires time. And sometimes it's actually, it's impossible, even if you try. And um, yeah, I believe it's still worth the time you invest, you know, it's still worth the time you invest doing that um, because I believe long-term and injury prevention wise, it's important. And so um, definitely for me, it's worth the time you invest. Now, Performance wise, we need to be honest and consider that as well. And to be clear with the rest of the staff, especially with the coach sometime, you know, that if we um, actually go through, uh, we decide to take that road, okay, to work more on uh, movement efficiency. Now for them to understanding their movement in the space, and it's going to require time. And maybe that performance is going to be affected negatively. Mm-hmm. And the coach need to be on board with that. If the coach is not on board with that, and the rest of the staff is not on board with that, uh, it's something we need to consider properly. Uh, yeah. Because other, otherwise, it's not going to work. Just uh, if uh, the SNC area is going to work by themselves, by ourselves. Uh, yeah. Would that be a time when there's like a, a tournament or a, you know, you've got some sort of championship around the corner? They're like, look, I don't want to move this now. But yeah. as you say, that the, the risk is the in, the injury prevention stuff is probably the biggest risk, right? You, you, it's you want them to to improve, yes, but also you don't want them to get hurt. And then if they, you know, maybe it's a risk that people and and maybe even as a coach you can be willing to take for you know if it's just playoffs and it's a couple of games, and then you say okay in the off season we're going to break this down. But the more Besides, time yeah. the more time you're doing this stuff, the more time you're you're or they are learning those bad habits and they keep ingraining those bad movement patterns mm-hmm. and stuff. Yeah. I, I know Brazil has quite a big bodybuilding culture as well. So yeah. I imagine that's where, you know, it's, it, you get it in all levels of rugby. That's the influence because we don't have more, you know, you, you mentioned New Zealand have the track and field background, which I, I want some, I want to ask some questions about that, but I'll, I'll say that for a second. Otherwise we all get our information from power lifters or from Olympic mm-hmm. lifters or from bodybuilders. Yeah. And then that leads everyone to think that getting big and getting strong makes you slower, makes you less athletic, which obviously we know is wrong, but mm. tends to happen. 
And I think we said, that, you know, we can kind of tell that it happens because they move poorly. So are there any tools or um, methods that you use to, to mm. sort of correct that and, and have people moving more athletically yeah. as opposed to being, I don't know, muscle bound or just moving poorly? Yeah, so it really depends on the athletes, okay? Mm. Uh, you know, and, uh, each, each situation is different, but uh, there are some common lines that they uh, usually organize this way. So, for example, I like to divide, uh, you know, still I like to divide uh, production, force production, whatever is uh, in the gym or on the field, okay? And the production of force can be done, uh, you know, like fast or slow. And as well, the same thing on the field. I like to work on speed and uh, multidirectional speed. And that these, uh, these are four components. And after that, on the other side, uh, I have, of course, all the conditioning part of fitness. Now, from that side, uh, so for example, if I want to have an improvement uh, in the production of force, and actually there is not the technique, you know, to have uh, actually that benefit, sometimes what I do is while uh, I try to create the program, the movement, at the same time, I always give the option on some alternative exercise they can still benefit the performance. Let's take an example. Now, some athletes, they can actually not do um, Olympic lifting, okay? Mm -hmm. It requires time for them to learn. During the time that I do that kind of work, okay? So I go through all the uh, learning, imagine of the um, handling. At the same time, the athletes will still complete medicine ball, uh, medicine ball throw workout. Mm -hmm that uh, is going to still benefit, you know, because the goal of the Olympic weightlifting is actually fast production of force, you know? And, uh, okay, while they're learning that, at the same time, they will still do medicine ball workout. And uh, so I still have the benefit while they are learning that movement. Mm -hmm. So at least that way, you always give an alternative, even if they are older athletes. Now, when you get some athletes when they have injuries, that's a different situation. Sometimes I actually don't go down to their road, you know, like if there is an exercise they cannot execute, sometimes I just say, okay, yeah, let's find an alternative state straight away. While if they are younger, I like to have this process. Same thing, for example, if you think about uh, speed, you know, like you have an athlete that is really good linear wise, okay, but they need to improve uh, uh, their ability of change of direction. And my idea is uh, while they, with a little a bit of stimulus of learning exercise, imagine just a drill, you know, simple exercise, no reaction, you know, a drill where they have to change of direction, 90, 90 degrees cut and back. That's really simple. There is no reaction. And while they are learning that, they will uh, still doing some 1v1 on the field, Mm -hmm. you know to get benefit and understanding applied on what they actually are going to do yeah on the field Perfect. they will you still always have uh, on one side you try to teach and on one side you try to perform yeah that's yeah. for me the strategy that i use no I, I like that a lot and i think it's the only fine thing that i found when i've used that style with athletes is that they'll get frustrated that they don't get the clean in in like two weeks and it's like no yeah. that's the point is that like we don't even need to be doing this clean. This clean is for six months time, yeah. you know? Yeah. I also like to keep, I think we've spoken on this already, but it, keep if you just keep things as simple, right? And your your explanation there is, is perfect for guys that like, you get an understanding that you can still get the benefit that the, the more complex thing is trying to do whilst keeping things simple. You, you, you know, you don't even need the complex thing potentially ever. But it's there if you are learning it for when you need it. And then you can learn. And if you do learn it well, I guess it's just more of an efficient way. You know, like once you've got that technique, yeah. the biggest thing people will have against Olympic lifts, and I'll say that I don't always use them but for the same reason, right? Is that they are complex to learn. But I've got people that I know do them efficiently. Of course, I'll put them in because you'd be silly not to because you'd get so many benefits yeah. from them in, in, in one movement. And, but they take they do take a while to learn it's the same thing but then that's one thing that's kind of optional but then like moving laterally on a field multi-directional movement that's not an option you have to do that so you have to yeah. uh, practice that and, and it's it's funny because people think okay if i can get really good at the l drill mm -hmm. then i'm really or, or, or um, yeah. any any lateral I, I can be the best stepper ever and it's like no yeah. like stepping people is more about 
the opposition. You could be a terrible stepper, but go around people really well because you it's 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 a tactical thing again, right? We yeah. could even go back yeah. to the 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 example of if you're if if you're if you're you know the, the Kiwis that are learning the game and they're already established mm -hmm. as an adult, like they might not be physically as good at stepping, but because they see that space much better than you know someone that started the game when they're 22 they're going to look like they're much more efficient uh, even mm -hmm. if they're not so it definitely goes both ways but su super yeah. interested is there any other like tools that you can use in the gym to help either skill wise or, or tactical preparation wise as well mm -hmm. that you use for, for those people there is one thing that we have used and i've used it in the past is uh, actually implement during the gym training some technical part imagine with the men for example we used to do some exercise or imagine exercise strength exercise combined with uh, ball throw or can be medicine ball lateral pass combined with the ball lateral pass you know like uh, these exercises, I found them uh, uh, useful, especially for some situation or some kind of athletes. For example, here I'm not using them a lot, but in Brazil we used them a lot. And it was really common to have uh, the technical coach together you know, with us in the gym at the same mm -hmm. time. But for example, here, but for example, here we are not using too much. Sometimes that one uh, can get in the way as well. Uh, what I mean with that, logistic wise, you know, it's just okay. If you have a space, big space, if you have all the equipment that you want, you can actually organize and uh, really use your fantasy, you know, to combine uh, some mm -hmm. of these components. While if you don't have uh, the space, uh, you don't have enough to keep as well, sometimes the understanding or the experience of the athletes and you want to try to implement, it's not going to work. Uh, you will not see the benefit. For example, in Brazil, uh, we were doing a lot of um, squat combined with the scrum position, okay, with the elastic band. Um, that was really common for us, especially for, for our forwards. And for example, here, it's a little bit harder, you know, like I feel like I cannot implement the same. Why is that? Because the athletes, they come from a, all different backgrounds, different nations. And for me, it's hard to implement that. And so, yeah, having a technical component in the gym happened in the past, but here, for example, I'm not applying it. Yeah, I um, think it's a same you've got to plan example, logistics, right? I was going to yeah, say yeah. you've got to plan yeah. the logistics. It makes it it can be difficult, and and it's not like it's just some. It's a tool to use, I guess, right? It's not, it's not everything. Yeah, yeah. So mainly that uh, there was a, there is one thing that I I really like to work both uh, fifteen and seven is resisted speed. Mm -hmm. You know, like for me, it's a really a simple, effective, and you know, like. Definitely requires sometimes as well of a learning, a learning curve, but the benefit in my experience are straight away, you know, especially, especially on acceleration component, more than on maximum speed in my experience. But definitely, you know, like as well, for example, we did a lot of work combining resisted speed still with the ball in our hands, you mm -hmm. know, but there is still that application and the understanding, okay, it's not actually just running fast, you know, but at the same time is running fast with the resistance, at the same time working with my arms, with my hands. One of the work that we did a lot uh, in Brazil and I'm doing it here is a bullet. So um, resisted speed, the first five meters, release the load at maximum speed, catch the ball, you know, and complete that for 40 meters. Simple, you know, nothing hard, but for me really effective. And the athletes, uh, for example, uh, sometimes they can decide that if they want to go straight, if they want to do it in curve, you know, and that's help as well. For example, in Brazil, we use a lot about step outside and go outside. And, uh, you know, it's something that the athletes say, oh, yeah, I, I can find, I can see the application. And uh, it's really useful. I've used it uh, in Brazil. I used it in New Zealand and I'm using it here in Japan as well. Yeah, res resisted sprints are good because speed in general is it's it's one of the most difficult, especially actually really definitely like acceleration. It's hard to to yeah. to work the technicality because you're you're falling to the ground <laughs> the whole time, right? So it's you you can't work your feet without overstepping or just falling over. So the only way to slow it to to work it is to slow it down. 
if you slow it down that without resistance, you're not really working your acceleration at all. You have to slow it down with resistance. It's the only way it works. And it, and it has a huge benefit if done right. It's just that often yeah. what people do is they'll they'll just load up as heavy as they possibly possibly can and they'll just sprint or they'll do what you know it's just something that they see and, and they just people do too much like they don't clearly what you've done is everything that you do you're thinking about okay how can I get this result that I want on the field right what's the result what what's the difference and, and how can yeah. I make that up. Most people just see stuff online and then they just copy it. Uh, and they think that's a good idea. You know? I, I, I said that in the past, probably at the moment, the one of the worst thing I see is really most of the thing as just copy and paste, mm -hmm. you know, copy and paste. I see yeah. that they copy and I paste in my situation when it's, you know, like here in Japan, they say like that, you know, <laughs> they do it <laughs> like that. It's not, it's actually, you know, like, okay, you see it, and after that, you analyze your situation. Is it going to fit in my situation? Because definitely, you know, like most of the stuff that you can see on internet, you know, like maybe can affect positively athletes or in different environment. Yeah, you know, like uh, I, I agree. But is it going to be right for my situation? Mm -hmm. uh, is it going to produce the results that I actually want in my situation with my athletes, with my team? Probably that's the, one of the things that the moment I see the most, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you see the same, but... No, I do. Yeah. It's it's 100%. It's like, people, there's no... People people don't even think about what their outcome they want is. So how they can figure out the, what their plan is to, you know what I mean? Like, they don't know what they want to achieve. Yeah. They've never, or, or they have an idea, but they've never really properly thought about it. And then if they do, if they, they know exactly what they're, they're trying to achieve, they don't really know where they're at in relation to that. They just look at who already is there. And, you know, that that's why you have people uh, sweep in the changing rooms because that's what they think it takes to be the All Blacks, whereas the All Blacks have got so much other things that go into them being, you know, the greatest team in world rugby for the last 20 years. You know, it, it's not the sweep in the changing rooms. It's so many other things. And that's, again, you, you can sweep the changing rooms, be a good person, but that's not what's going to make you... A world champion yeah. what actually might the, help you know, this is these are actually you go ahead sorry no no go ahead yeah. it, you know like and these apply for for me as you know like for example you said now you are in thailand no and experiencing mm -hmm. uh, that that culture and there was one moment where okay oh no everyone we need to put jujitsu into rugby mm -hmm. but do the athletes have the background and the, the ability to actually practice safely properly and actually have the benefit as as well of that component in rugby you know for example sometimes you get okay some of the you know jujitsu training are, are really complex you know mm -hmm. to apply and if i think you know a forward trying to apply that uh, i think like okay yeah or you're really good or you need time to learn that before you can actually do it properly and you know for example sometimes is okay do a step back Let's work first on some pulling, pushing, fighting symbol, you know? Oh. Yeah. You know, some, you know, just similar without, just sorry, linear without twisting. And after that, you start on your knees. After that, you go up, you know, some rope fighting, something more safe. And after that, you progress in something more complex instead of, oh, I saw that drill come from jujitsu. Oh, yeah, let's go apply yeah. it. Yeah, especially you see it in pros and, and pros have got like a much higher level of force that makes it much riskier. I think there's been a, a number of injuries for, I think from judo as well, where they, oh, you know, they have coaches come in and, and, and there are definitely like, I like the idea of exploring other sports to see where you can yeah. improve, but you have to take elements. You can't take the whole, I mean, it's the same thing as people want, they want CrossFit to, to fit into rugby, you know, and they say, hey, say is that you can take CrossFit and make it benefit you. Well, let's not do that. Let's just take a few things, whichever is beneficial. You know, I don't have to be doing double unders. I don't have to do a handstand. Like, yeah, yeah. and I think what people don't see is everything that you're trying to do sort of adds in, adds more things into, onto your plate. You know, mm -hmm. and your plate's only so big. Even like yoga, people think, okay, if uh, I got this, ask this question the other week, you know, oh, mm -hmm. I want to do yoga. That, is that going to help me play rugby for longer? And I'm like, well, is it, is it going to make you stronger? No. Is it going to, yeah. like, it's, 
it, it's good, but what it is going to do is going to take away time that you could have spent in the gym or you could have spent getting fitter or whatever it is. It's not, it's not just something that is, it's, there's no free lunch, you know, there's, you have to, I don't know if you understand that expression. It's a, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, you can't just, ever, no, yeah, it's not this stuff will, everything takes away some somewhere right you're all everything's on on this spectrum and yeah. i think that, yeah. like a valuable tool that, that we we think might might actually be of a detriment to another athlete and that's that's i think mm. i think unfortunately for people listening because people always want okay tell me what my workout is how many reps am i got to do what movement have i got to do and it's just the reason i do this podcast is it says yeah, yeah we've done 200 episodes now and it's like it's it there's yeah. there's so many different um routes that people can take and and different ways people methods people can use and then there's even so many more things that people don't need to do that others might yeah it never ends uh, i was i was having a chat with with previous snc coach um even of the italian national team and you know like and we were talking about how hard in a sports environment for example for me that i come from track and field individualized work is really important you know individual sport you just have to worry about one athlete mm -hmm. and you know like you can uh, plan everything uh, strength training uh, power training whatever periodization of just one athlete you know and you just have to worry about it in a sports environment it's so complex and uh, you know like and it's and i said oh you know like i always uh, try to individualize but uh, of course it, it is hard and as you said you know for for who is listening uh, for me is uh, find a specialist, you know, someone that actually can help yourself understanding your situation, your environment, your training time, your experience, your background. And after that, you know, like a specialist that actually can help that and, uh, you know, and create an, uh, a program uh, and a plan, you know, like everything for yourself based on your situation, not what I think is right, and I try to, okay, this is what I think is right. I try to squeeze, I try to fit everything because I think it's right. And so you have to do it. No, 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 no. It's the opposite way, I yeah. think. Yeah. Because <laughs> also, like, I've been in that situation as a player, you know, like, uh, and, and probably mm -hmm. everyone has as an athlete, right? You want to do something and then you see something else, something new, or, or you remember yeah. something that you used to do and you're like, ah, oh, I should do that again. Why are you going? You, you, but you have to take someone else away to do that. And you're like, no, I don't want to do that. And then all of a sudden, you've done a program for two weeks and it's already completely changed because we're emotional. We don't want to. We don't want to miss out on anything. We want to be doing everything now, all the time, so that we can constantly be getting better. No one wants to do a long-term plan that we're we're not even working on any speed at all for these first two months because we're building the foundation, or we're not, you know, whatever it is. Uh, that it becomes frustrating, you know, especially when you're in charge and, and you've, you know, you're very emotionally attached to your own results. I think that's the biggest thing that like, yeah. Yeah. Is, is really good with an individualized coach is that like, they're not emotionally attached to your results in, in the same way. You know, mm -hmm. they're not, they, they know, they, they, they trust in the plan and they can stick to the plan. And even if you do as, as someone that, you know, again, I've written down, I've done it before where I've written like four months of my own training. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this block and this block. But it lasts mm -hmm. two weeks because emotionally, like I want to, I want to do more. And, and yeah. I, you know, someone that even if you are all that knowledge doesn't help you because it's, you've got to figure out what not to do, not, not what more things that you can do. Yeah. You know, I wanted to touch on, as I mentioned earlier, the athletics side of things mm. so you said that yeah. you you, yeah. you got well obviously you've got a track and field background you said that a big yeah. thing that you see with the new zealanders is that a lot of them get uh, yeah. track and field work i think this is an area that rugby's only just starting to to mm. see and try to utilize do you think it, and, and then people say okay i'm, I'm going to start to do plyometrics and all they do is they just mm. put some box jumps as part of their warm-up <laughs> it's not even plyometrics what are some i i like i don't want to Try, I want to try and get something that we can actually take away, right? Rather than yeah. everything. Yeah. What, what are some things, maybe it's just principles or, or ideas, yeah. or even if we can yeah. think of like some uh, strategies yeah. or whatever, or, or even just movements and, and exercises themselves. What are some thing, key things that consistently have success in track and field yeah. that we just don't see or don't see as much as we should do in rugby? I, be uh, 
Good, good question. I believe definitely you get a couple of them. For me, three points that are applied in track and field, but I've seen them applied as well now in rugby more and more. It's the use of the medicine ball mm-hmm. instead of just Olympic weightlifting, the use of hurdles to improve stiffness, you know, and plyometric and power of the athletes. And uh, now the combining the strength training with power. So contrast training. I believe uh, these three components are, uh, I believe, three meters that they are, they've been used uh, in track and field for a long time. You know, like even uh, when I was a thrower, they were already there. I remember as a thrower, you know, that there were was there was this kettlebell. You know, no one used it over there. It was all rusty, and uh, we were using it just uh, because it was there and because we were lucky that there were some uh, Russian thrower that came in in our Olympic center. And so I believe these components uh, they can have a benefit on rugby athletes, both uh, 15 and sevens. Now, what is the the thin line? Um, for example, in 15, especially when you work with forwards, you need to be careful because, as you said before, you work with athletes that they actually are really, really heavy. They can produce big forces. And, you know, like, for example, if you introduce even some really simple jumping hurdles exercise, you know, with big stiffness, it's a big load for them. So that's one thing you need to take in account when you plan that uh, and you want to integrate that in your in your reality in uh, rugby 15. Sevens is a little bit different, of course. And definitely medicine ball, for me, you know, like is always an alternative. If uh, your goal is uh, producing force at high speed and you don't have to worry necessarily about the technique. And when I say it's not that there is no technique, you know, of a medicine ball throw, but actually it's a, a way easier to apply force that way than, you know, in a gym environment with Olympic weightlifting. Mm-hmm. Now combining, imagine, combining strength training together with some jumps or even a medicine ball throw. For example, one of the exercises we used to do a lot was a squat with um, 90% of your one RM, two reps, and after that medicine ball backward throw straight away, you know, three sets of that. That's it. Same thing, for example, we did uh, with the upper body. We did that with the Smith machine and a bench throw. So we did that with uh, 30% of your 1RM on the bench, okay? And the athletes after that, they were going into um, some medicine ball front row or even uh, some landmine, you know, landmine exercises. And those kind of exercises, I believe uh, they, were ben- they, were, they were good, safe, you know, not nothing complex. And actually simple because you can apply them in different environments. Not necessarily, you know, you don't need uh, expensive equipment. Uh, and I saw the benefits on the field after that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I like the contrast training a lot. I'll go in the reverse order. So the contrast training, I like a lot. I use it a lot. It's especially for people that need to already strong, but want to be more explosive. Yeah. Like, they don't want to come too far away from the weights because that's what makes them feel strong and, and feel good, you know, or maybe they even want to get stronger and also more powerful. Fantastic. Right. You're, it doesn't cost you too much more time, but you're getting a, a big benefit. I, rarely do I see a reason not to do it. It's only if you really want to push that strength and you think, and maybe the jumps are just taken away from the rest, but even mm-hmm. then, like yeah. just to do, I think doing, uh, contrast training is fantastic. The the well, the second one was the stiffness. Now, mm. a lot of people get this wrong with plyometrics, right? They'll do jumps and they'll do uh, landings, but then they'll land a really soft knees and then they'll bounce up and 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 they'll they'll think, oh, okay, cool, I'm jumping really high, and it's like, no, it's not about that. It's about yeah. being on the floor yeah. for as little time as possible, mm-hmm. right? I think we'll get there slowly. But that, 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 but that stiffness is, as you say, it's so much more force that you're applying mm-hmm. to the ground because you're coming from, a, you know, even, even if you're just jumping and you're trying to stay stiff and you're trying to do mm-hmm. that, like that's, that's a lot of force and people aren't used to that. And because it's not, it's not like, you know, putting, yeah, you know, if you're putting 150 kilos on your back or you're, or even more or whatever, like you're feeling that way. You're not really feeling that force mm-hmm. as you're doing it until it's like too late and you're run down. So be, people have to be very yeah. careful with that stuff. But done right, 
it's fantastic, right? Because it is, it's a tool that can translate very quickly. Yeah, definitely. Medicine balls. Now, this shows mm. me that you work more with teams than with like other individual <laughs> athletes because I love medicine balls, but everywhere yeah. I use them or I get my athletes to use them, we've either got broken walls, <laughs> like yeah, holes in the walls. I'm like, why have you got a, why have you got medicine balls and then all of your walls are drywall? It doesn't make any sense. Like they yeah. don't have like gyms get medicine balls in, but they don't know why to like they don't know why they're being used. Yeah. Or they're getting yeah. people, you know, I, I've had at least in the last month, I've had at least two or three of my clients say, oh, can we switch out medicine balls? I don't want to get kicked out of my gym. Like the staff are complaining that I'm slamming them or yeah, using them into the wall, yeah. or whatever. And I'm just, yeah. I just think, why have they got medicine balls then if, if you're not allowed to throw them? Like, what, what's um, the point? But yeah. otherwise they're really fantastic. Now I've, I always wrap mm. my brain because when people say, okay, can I do an alternative? There's really not a lot that there is. Like you mentioned the bench press throw, like plyometric yeah. push-ups kind of, but it's too, it's way too much load. Yeah, you know, mm. short of saying, you know, get a better gym or, or throw it into a soft box or go with a partner. Like, I think it is mm. like throwing it. What I did in lockdown is I just said to everyone, like go out and find a place that's got one heavy rock and just find a heavy rock and just throw, mm. <laughs> throw yeah. that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, you know? it doesn't have to be a perfect shape, you know? Yeah, I believe, you know, like, uh, imagine, imagine as well, I, I think about just not athletes, you know, just uh, some common, common people that uh, just want to get in shape uh, and uh, always taking account no injuries. Okay. So no problem like that. You know, for me, the best thing would be, okay, yeah, you want to get fit and you're going to, you want to get strong, take a medicine ball, go in the park. Okay. And have fun throwing the medicine ball, you know, and running uh, on the back and forward uh, every time you throw it, you know, just a funny way. You just, you go in the park, uh, you stay in a uh, uh, open space, you see other people. There is nothing wrong with that. You don't have to carry big equipment, you know, just 4G uh, medicine ball. You can experience a lot of exercise methods combined. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're to, talking uh, to 17, 18 year old me here. When I was that, because I used to train at my rugby club gym and they had a medicine ball. And I, I think it was the that the movie 300 came out. And, and yeah, I remember yeah, like yeah. watching the clips of them training like Jim Jones. It was kind of like CrossFit before CrossFit. Yeah. I used to go out and I used to do like, I do a length of the field, just throwing the ball different ways. And then I do two lengths, just throwing it everywhere I could. And like, you know, I got yeah. really fit. Like <laughs> it worked, man. Now I would do things a little bit different, but like that is, yeah. it is I think... I do think like they're not they're not expensive to buy a medicine ball. Maybe maybe that's that's a solution is just get everyone to buy one medicine ball yeah. and then that's their own yeah. personal one. But yeah, definitely, um, I think they're, they're such a good tool. But yeah, like for example, in a, in a, in a team environment is different. You know, like you, you have the uh, the chance to use in the indoor field, so you have more space, a lot of equipment, and of course you can plan differently. But for me as well medicine ball landmine is another you know uh, mm -hmm. tool that i often in i often put and in, in my in my training programs landmine kettlebell of course you know i believe everything uh, can have a place depending about the situation yeah. and the athlete and the environment the key thing is that you know if they if they want to be more explosive and more athletic then they've got to do mm. explosive movements like they get to a point where just lifting weights doesn't cut it right no, that's what, you know, like, uh, if you actually want to get powerful, you know, or faster, yeah, probably, definitely there is a benefit of maximum strength. There is a benefit of that, yes. But you have to go, you have to go, you need to practice as, as well, producing that force, you know, in a short time. Because otherwise, you are not going to get better in that. And uh, mostly, uh, if you analyze on the field, you know, like most of that production of force happen in a short time. And it's, you know, a scrum maybe, but most of the time, uh, always the production of that force happen in a really short time. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, you need, to, you need to have tools to stimulate that. Yeah. And I think calling them tools is, is what people miss right is that they're, they're tools as we mentioned already to get someone where they want to be there's not just copy and paste oh this is i'm going to add this yeah. to my plate add this to my plate no you, everything is a specific tool for a purpose you, you, you know you can't you can't use it 
for something that's not the purpose and you can't just copy what someone else is doing. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Adi, this has been great, mate. Now, if people want to go find out more about your coaching or, or follow yeah. more information from you, how can they, is there a way you want to be contacted? I am on Twitter, um, like um, on, uh, but on LinkedIn as well. Everyone is, feel free to, to stay in touch. I don't use a lot of Instagram. I don't have Instagram. And, but, you know, like Facebook as well, I'm really open uh, to share ideas and uh, what I've done, my experience and always keen to learn as well, because you never stop learning. And so, yeah, we, we did write uh, some papers as well together with, uh, with NAR back in Brazil. And so there is a little bit of research uh, done that, and we're still doing some research on code, the change of direction. So yeah, but mainly these. Yeah, I'll get, I think follow LinkedIn. I, I, I try and get people off of Twitter. Twitter is, especially around the rugby crowd, it, it seems there's a lot of aggressive people and angry people on Twitter. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah. Instagram's yeah. not too much better, but <laughs> that's good, man. Like staying away from social media is, is, is a wise choice, Adi. For yeah, sure. yeah, that's the one there. <laughs> cool, man. This has been great.